This is VLX number 148, In Memory of Her. We are in St. Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 to 13. VLX stands for Video Lexi Divina, the Patristic Bible Study and Ignatian Prayer Series Online. God give you his peace and nomine patri sefidi et spiritu santi. Amen. God, O oh Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. In nomine patri sefidi et spiritu santi. Amen. And if you are listening to this in real time, the 8th of April, 2024, happy Annunciation. I always say this is the most underrated of all feasts because not only is this the Annunciation to Mary, it is also the Incarnation. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring, this out, in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So if you're listening in real time, we are in Easter season. I had hoped to get today's section in Lent, but we're always slower than I expected. And so I had thought before reading the section for Father Lapi Day today, that Jesus had only spent about two days at Bethany before he went to Jerusalem for the flagellation, the crowning of thorns, the crucifixion. But it turns out, reading Father Lapide, who lined up all of the Synoptic Gospels with St. John, that Jesus spent almost six days in Bethany. Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. And so Father Lapide points out that if you connect all the Gospels and the Church Fathers, Jesus spent nearly a week at Bethany with these close friends in this quiet, sleepy town two miles away from Jerusalem, before he would walk on the night of Holy Thursday to Jerusalem for the Last Supper and his arrest. And so let's picture this. Let's picture this in Bethany today. That's where we are in Matthew 26 today. This, Matthew 26, this is Jesus in this tremendous intimacy with his closest friends before he dies. And these friends are obviously Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And so I would, I would encourage you to imagine being in this party, Imagine being one of the closest friends of Jesus when nearly the entire Jewish hierarchy of the first century was rejecting him. To know Jesus is the beginning of eternal life. We read this in John 17, 3. We read, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's Jesus' final prayer before he dies. And so knowing Christ, being in this intimacy of friendship, is the beginning of eternal life. And you can picture yourself in this scene. We're going to talk about whose home it is in Bethany because there's some debate if it was Martha and Mary's home or the home of uh, Simon the leper. We're going to see it's the latter and why that's the case. But place yourself in this home. Smell the ointment that Mary Magdalene opens. See yourself at this table. They say those tables back then were about a foot off the ground, horseshoe shaped. You can place yourself at this table in this last week of friendship before the death of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is at Bethany, as I said, for about a week before walking those two miles from Bethany to Jerusalem on Holy Thursday. And this is a week of great closeness to friends. Now, another amazing thing is that Christ could be friends with anyone in the world, and he stays at the home of a leper, Simon the leper. And again, this is the week leading up to his execution. Christ predicts this again today at the beginning of Matthew 26 when he says this. This is the first verse we're looking at and the first verse of Matthew 26. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Okay, and then the next couple of verses say, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, 
and blotted together, plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Okay, so that's obviously the Pharisees that have decided to wait. So while Jesus is spending this last week on earth before he raises himself by his own power, spends this week with friends in the silence of sunny Bethany, meanwhile, the chief priests are in Jerusalem under the power of Satan, planning the death of Christ. Now, St. John takes an even closer look at their reasonings than any of the other synoptic, synoptic writers. St. John wrote in uh, John chapter 11, Caiaphas, who is high priest that year, said to them, it means the other high priests, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. That's verses 49 and 50 of St. John chapter 11. So notice right there that Caiaphas just argued that the ends justifies the means. And I think you should remember that next time you have what you think is a good excuse to sin, remember the Catholic Church has always rejected the end and justifying the means. And that's exactly what Caiaphas did to justify the execution of Christ. He thought it was better for one person to die than for everybody to die. And so anytime you have an excuse to sin, remember that re-crucifies Christ. But even then, check this out, even then Caiaphas, since he was high priest, he accidentally prophesied. He accidentally prophesied, and St. John points that out. He says, Caiaphas did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one, the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Isn't that astonishing? The high priest of Israel says Jesus would have to die for Israel. He didn't mean to say that, but he, he ironically spoke the truth since he was high priest. It shows that priests who are in sin still have certain powers. And um, he said that, the week before Christ's death in Jerusalem while Jesus is in Bethany. Now, Father Lapide explains that these uh, Pharisees, high priests, the scribes, they actually wanted to wait until Passover week, or rather after Passover week, to kill Jesus. But it didn't work out, and so they couldn't wait. Here's what Father Lapide says about that. He says, It was not, therefore, out of regard for the festival, but from fear of the people that they were unwilling to take Jesus on the feast of the Passover for at this feast, a countless multitude of Jews flocked together to Jerusalem, among whom were many who had received salvation, both of body and soul from Jesus, who they feared would defend him. For the Passover was to the Jews a festival of liberty and joy, because in it they celebrated their deliverance from the slavery of Egypt. But here's where divine providence comes in. Father Lapide says, The rulers therefore had decreed to take Christ and put him to death after the Passover, but in consequence of the treachery of Judas, they changed their purpose. For the counsel and purpose of God was that Christ should die at the Passover, in order that he might show that the antitype, that means the type or the symbol, answered to its type or initial symbol, the Old Testament symbol. Father Lapide says, For the sacrifice of a lamb which took place at the Passover was a type that Christ would be sacrificed at that feast. By this circumstance, God signified that Christ was the very Paschal Lamb who suffered upon the cross for the redemption of the world. But now we look two miles away to sleepy Bethany where Jesus, he's out of the gaze of his enemies to spend this last week on earth. And so imagine being there, how much time you would love to spend with him, what you would say to him, how attentive to him you would be in listening. But you don't have to go to, in some time machine, back to Bethany, any time that you are with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. It doesn't have to be exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in a, in a monstrance. Even a closed tabernacle is, is remaining with the same Christ, the same Son of God in a church, if you want to adore him, if you want to speak to him as a friend for hours. So today we really see what is closest to our Lord's heart. And because the Sacred Heart is pure love, we're going to see that Christ is love incarnate. So the thing he most responds to the thing that makes men and women most like him is love, is charity, is supernatural charity. So as we go back to Matthew 26, listen to verses 6 and 7 now. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. 
So as I said a little bit earlier, the tables that they had were only about a foot off the ground. I think they were horseshoe shaped, if I remember correctly. So presumably Jesus is reclining on some pillows or his elbow with his legs off to the side or even behind this table. And then another gospel writes that this woman anointed his feet. But this is weird because Matthew just said she anointed his head. So who's correct? Well, they both are. Father Lapidus says both head and feet were anointed. He writes you, and sometimes when he says you, he means like the naysayer. It's almost like he's predicting the modernist scripture scholar you, as in a naysayer of the Gospels who thinks they found some apparent contradiction. You will say that St. John has that she anointed the feet of Jesus, and he means this is in contradic- or contradiction to St. Matthew, where we see the head. And Father Lapide has a simple answer. He says, I answer that Mary Magdalene first anointed the feet of Christ and then poured all the contents of the vessel upon his head. To do this, she broke off the narrow neck of the bottle as we gather from St. Mark. So St. Augustine adds that John adds that she wiped his feet, that is, before she anointed them, to cleanse them from dust. So right there, it's not a... uh, You see, every gospel writer is not required to explain every detail included by the other gospel writer. And those who doubt the authenticity because they include different, not contradictory details... Well, they apparently just don't have the same childlike faith as St. Mary Magdalene, who recklessly spends all of her money on the body of Jesus. And I think it's St. Augustine who pointed out, I couldn't find this in Lapide, but if I remember correctly, it was St. Augustine who points out that she who sold her body for such money that eventually purchased this expensive ointment or oil spent it entirely on the body of Jesus in reparation for her sins in her body upon Jesus who would die the next week. And what a beautiful insight from St. Augustine, if I'm remembering that correctly. It really shows that we all need to make reparation like that and that Jesus does not refuse a reckless spending on him that spends everything, all of one's life, all of one's sacrifice on him. So let's look at this. If you're going to do the imaginative way of prayer, combine both St. John's view of this and St. Matthew's view of this. So first she anoints his feet, but then she comes and pours it all over his head, this expensive ointment or oil, Mary Magdalene pours it all over the head of Jesus at this dinner. Not, not in a fast or sloppy manner. I, would, I picture it this way. St. Mary Magdalene pours this slowly over his head with great devotion. Why? Why is she doing this? Well, Jesus says exactly why a few verses later in verse 12. He says, In pouring this ointment on my body, She has done it to prepare me for burial. She's done it to prepare me for burial. Now, we're going to see from the Church Fathers, it's not exactly evident that St. Mary Magdalene even knows he's going to die. Maybe she was listening to all these prophecies and she knows it. Or maybe Jesus is just speaking prophetically. But one way or the other, whether it's in her conscience or her subconscious, she's doing it for for his burial. The Latin actually there, when Jesus says to prepare me for burial, the Latin is ad sepiliendum, May, ad to May, which is literally for the sepulchring of me, for the sepulchring of me. So whether St. Mary Magdalene knew of his coming death or not, Jesus knew how to take this act of her spending all of her money to come to him at a dinner and anoint his feet. And then the big showstopper is pouring this all over his head at this dinner. Again, not in a rapid manner, but slowly and with devotion. Pouring it over his head would have been a showstopper. So what do you think you would do if you were at that dinner? You know, if you committed a lot of sins like St. Mary Magdalene, or even one mortal sin in your life, could you do an act of loving reparation just like that in front of other people? She knew at some surface level of her emotions it would be embarrassing, but at the deepest level of her heart it didn't matter because this was for Christ. But whose home was this in? Most people who read John's Gospel think it was in the home of Mary and Martha. Um, But here in St. Matthew we learn it was Simon the leper. Once again, Father Lapide explains the apparent contradiction. Notice the word apparent, the apparent contradiction, because it's not a real contradiction. Father Lapide says, You may object that St. John says they made him a feast and Martha served, which might seem to intimate that the feast was in Martha's house, not in Simon's. I reply by denying the inference. John does not say that Martha and Mary made him a feast, but simply that they, that is, some persons made one, that is, a feast. The persons meant their the persons meant were the inhabitants of Bethany, friends of Jesus, prominent among whom was this Simon the leper. 
But Martha ministered at the supper, either because she was a neighbor or because she was a friend and relative of Simon. Okay, so there you have it. It's, it's at Simon's house, and most likely Simon's neighbors were Martha and Mary, and they just came over. And it makes Mary's, Mary's move even more bold to put this oil over Jesus' feet and then his head to do this at someone else's home. Okay, what do we know about this oil or this ointment? Father Lapide writes, It is certain that spikenard, or spikenard, compounded with oil, formed a very precious ointment, with the ancients made use of for anointing the head. The word is precious, or in Greek, baratimu, meaning of great price. And what this shows us is that Jesus deserves the best, not the leftovers of our life. And then what did she keep it in? Father Lapide says, a hollow vessel, which was as thin and brittle as glass, so that this might easily be broken by St. Mary Magdalene by striking it with a small hammer so that she might pour the whole of the ointment upon the head of Christ. Now, I've been calling her St. Mary Magdalene, but you might notice that in Matthew 26, she's just called a woman. Well, who is this? I will admit there's some debate on who she, on who she is even among the saints, but Father Lapide and some of the church fathers and some of the greatest saints do say it's St. Mary, Mary Magdalene, and I go with them. Father Lapide writes this. Basically, he asks, who is this woman? He says, this is St. Mary Magdalene, as St. John expressly says in chapter 12, verse 3, who, as she had two years before this, repented and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and anointed them with ointment. So upon this occasion, likewise, six days before his death, she did the same thing, partly from devotion and partly by an inspiration from God as a kind of prophecy of Christ's rapidly approaching death and burial. Christ might have excused Mary because of the excellence of his, of his divine person, which was anointed by her, which made it more meritorious to expand to expend the price of the ointment upon him than upon feeding the poor. Now, where does this business of putting the poor before Jesus come in? We're going to get to that verse in a minute because this protest on such expensive ointment seems to start with Judas, but St. John points out that this pretext of love of the poor, according to St. John, Judas's apparent love of the poor is just a pretext. It's fake. Because St. John writes in chapter 12 um, exactly how and why Judas protests to this woman, but, but what is in Judas's heart. So St. John writes this in chapter 12. Judas says, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Now here's another apparent contradiction between John and Matthew. John just told us that it was Judas was the one so concerned with the poor as a pretext. But then Matthew, if you just paid attention to the very gospel I read today in this VLX, Matthew wrote this, And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. That's Matthew 26 verses 8 and 9 from today's gospel. So doesn't that seem like a contradiction? John says it was Judas, where Matthew puts the blame on numerous disciples. So next Jesus says this, But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, and we'll get to what he actually said to them in a minute, but real quick, why did he say aware of this if they were at the same table? Well, there's only one possible answer. It was at the other end of the table where they whispered about her. But Jesus is God, so he knows this, even if his human ears couldn't hear it, and then he rebukes them. We're going to get to that rebuke later. But let's look again. Was this just Judas, or was this Judas plus the other disciples ripping on Mary Magdalene? Well, again, Matthew uses the plural disciples. The Greek is hoi mathetai, very clearly the, the plural. Once again, Father Lapide explains this apparent discrepancy. He says, you, again, a naysayer who thinks he caught the different gospel writers in a lack of corroboration in their tall tales, you may say that St. John speaks only of Judas as murmuring, but, Lapide says, St. Augustine answers that in that Judas was the leader and inciter of this murmuring who stirred up the other apostles in the pretense of pity for the poor to indignation, which in their case flowed from a real affection of pity, but with him was a mere pretense springing from avarice. So notice right there, Judas has the pretense of love of the poor, but he has some influence on these disciples. Because he says this, and they're kind of like, 
yeah, maybe Mary Magdalene shouldn't have spent all this money. We could have used this from the poor. Now, why would they come to that conclusion? Obviously, because our Lord has such a care and devotion for the poor everywhere they go. So they're more excusable than Judas, money bags Judas, who pretends like he cares for the poor, but he actually doesn't care for our Lord's body or the poor. How do we know that? Well, because he sells Jesus' body down the river for 30 pieces of silver and is one of the main uh, causes of his death. And then we know he doesn't actually care for the poor because we just learned from St. John in chapter 12 that he's always stealing from the money bags. So the other apostles at this, at this dinner, they weren't thieves like Judas, and they also didn't betray Jesus for money like Judas, but it does show the influence Judas had over them that he could apparently get at least a few other apostles to grumble about this huge gift, um, which apparently, not really, but to, to some people's eyes, looked like it was wasted on the body of Jesus. Now, of course, all the other apostles would eventually repent of this and any other any other misunderstandings or, or venial sins or even mortal sins like, like Peter denying Jesus, they all repented of uh, abandoning our Lord. And of course, all the apostles gave their bodies for Jesus after Pentecost. Even St. John was um, put into oil outside the Latin gate and he was miraculously, he miraculously recovered, but it was quite nearly a martyrdom. Um, and so... The amazing thing, though, for Matthew 26 is all the apostles, they don't get it fully. They don't understand sacrificial charity as much as St. Mary Magdalene right now. Quite a lesson for all of us priests. We know the Eucharist is the body of Christ. We know that all the great cathedrals of Christendom were to honor the Eucharist. So keep this in mind. Every time you hear a Catholic say, oh, we should just sell all of our churches for the poor, they have the spirit of Judas. In fact, Calvin was alive just before Father Lapide, John Calvin, the Protestant revolter, well, he said something very similar to modernist Catholics who claim they care for the poor, but really they just want to destroy our churches made to honor the body of Christ. Father Lapide wrote 400 years ago, Judas meant to say that this anointment ought not to have been used for luxury and pleasure upon the head of Christ. This was the opinion of Calvin, who lest anyone should make use of the example of Mary Magdalene to approve of funeral honors in the way of lights, incense, and other like observations, but who cannot see that the spirit of Judas and Calvin are identical, and that the same Satan speaks by Calvin who spake by Judas, whom Christ proceeds to confute, end quote. So what Father Lapide is saying there is anytime you put the poor ahead of good liturgy, you have the spirit of Satan and Judas. Now, that isn't to say that the poor shouldn't be treated also, maybe almost equally as the body of Christ, since St. John Chrysostom does have a quote. I can't think of it right now. St. John Chrysostom does come pretty close to saying that. But notice that when John Chrysostom talks about taking care of chalices inside cathedrals, he's also saying you have to take great care of the poor on the outside of the cathedrals at the same time. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. But the difference between St. John Chrysostom and modernist Catholics is that St. John Chrysostom did his best for both good liturgy and the poor. You see, that's, that's the key here, where modern-day Judases, they really don't care for the physical body of Christ in the church, that is the Eucharist, by wanting beautiful art and beautiful churches. And let's keep in mind, through the errors of Russia, the uh, progressives, the modernists, they don't really care for the poor. There's nothing destroys the lives of the poor more than, we got to watch the algorithms here, the errors of Russia. And that there's a huge overlap between the people who inadvertently adhere to the errors of Russia and want to sell, you know, Vatican art to give to the poor. It's all hypocrisy. It's all the spirit of Judas and Calvin. And Father Lapide just said that's the spirit of Satan. Okay, so Jesus tells the apostles, especially to Judas, but he tells them all to leave Mary Magdalene alone. Let's hear that last several verses of today's section one more time. And as you hear this, keep in mind this false dichotomy between beautiful churches and taking care of the poor. Our Lord says this, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Okay, so I named today's VLX in memory of her. 
Now, usually we think of the word in memory of someone as we are approaching our Lord's death with the Last Supper, the Eucharist, and that's, that's exactly right. But I don't think it's an accident that our Lord says in memory of her because both today's gospel and whatever VLX we get to in the future with the Last Supper, they both refer to the death of Jesus Christ and that Jesus wanted this act in this obscure town by this rejected woman to be remembered forever in connection to his death. I mean, think about it. Do you know how many people in history have read the Bible, both Catholics and non-Catholics alike? Literally billions of people, not millions, but billions of people have read Matthew 26 today. It's actually another proof that Jesus is God. So he predicted, or rather proclaimed in his divinity, 2,000 years ago that billions of people would hear of this random ex-prostitute pouring expensive oil all over a carpenter turned rabbi. What's the chances of this? Well, only, only if Jesus is God could he have predicted this, or rather I should say in eternity proclaimed in his divinity this. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Prophecy fulfilled. Billions have heard of this act that, that she did. And Jesus, one of the many things he's given back to Mary Magdalene besides one of the highest levels of the beatific vision in heaven is everyone on earth remembers her, sees this act of great sacrificial charity, and we read this, we read today's gospel in memory of her. Father Lapide writes, St. Victor of Antioch paraphrases as follows, So far as I am from condemning her, this is like the words, as if Christ were to say, So far am I from condemning her as though she had done amiss, or blaming her as though she had not acted aright, that I will never suffer this deed of hers to be forgotten in all time to come. Yes, the whole world shall know what she did in a house and in obscurity, for she did it with a pious mind and with fervent faith and a contrite heart. What was done was pleasing, not so much because of the money that was spent as because of the faith which, with which she offered together with the ointment, for this was to me as the most fragrant of all odors. So this shows what Jesus thinks of reckless, reckless love that does not calculate. You know, one of the main mottos of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and I do a lot of this series based on his teaching, one of the main mottos of St. Ignatius of Loyola was to give without counting the cost. That's what St. Ignatius wanted all those early Jesuits and all the future Jesuits to live by. In Latin, dare nec computare. Computare is where we get that English word computer or uh, to compute, really. Jesus wants us to give without computing what it's going to cost us. Father Ripperger says a demon admitted once this about Mary, that Mary, not Mary Magdalene, but Mary, the Immaculate Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, Mary lived every incident on earth in her body, giving of herself without counting the personal cost for any sacrifice that she gave. Now, that doesn't mean that Mary lived a frenetic life, but it does mean she completely fulfilled that line from St. Ignatius of Loyola, to give without counting the cost. Dare nec computare. Secondly, to man, through fraternal charity, but primarily to God. Mary gave everything to God. Thank you so much to my donors, and please say an Our Father for me at Benedictio Dei Mipotentis, Pachi Sifidi, et Spiritu Santi, descendet super vos et maniat semper. Amen. <laughs>